Saturday marks three years since the January 6th assault on the Capitol. In that time, many of Donald Trump's party have revised their views in order to downplay their previous criticisms of then-President Trump as responsible for the attack. Here, for example, is Senator Lindsey Graham. His comments one day after the riots versus just this past weekend on Face the Nation. The president needs to understand that his actions were the problem, not the solution. It breaks my heart that my friend, a president of a consequence, would allow yesterday to happen. And it will be a major part of his presidency. They're prosecuting him for activity around January the 6th. He didn't break into the Capitol. He gave an, a, a fiery speech, but he's not the first guy to ever do that. It's just that kind of acceptance of Trump's behavior that President Biden says is a threat to democracy, the topic of his planned speech Friday in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. William Howell joins me now. He's a professor of American politics at the University of Chicago. Professor, it's good to have you here. Thank you. You wrote a book called Presidents, Populism and the Crisis of Democracy, which explored the much deeper forces facing the American system. But before we get to those deeper forces, I want to get with your get to your assessment of the more recent challenges to democracy, whether it's January 6th, um, uh, these indictments of the, the former president. How do you assess the state of things right now? Precarious. Um, and the threats are coming from all sides. There are concerns about the health and well-being of uh, elections, of course, um, and the possibility that we're going to have free and fair elections going forward. There are concerns about um, planned assaults on the administrative state, uh, the possibility that the Justice Department will be leveraged in order to prosecute enemies, as Trump has promised to do, should he regain power. Uh, the, 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 the potential assaults are coming from all sides, and it's a, it's a, a really precarious moment. What do you make of, if we played that, uh, that clip of Lindsey Graham and his evolution from condemnation to acceptance, Speaker Kevin McCarthy, former Speaker Kevin McCarthy, went the same road, condemnation to acceptance. Yeah. Uh, Congressman Tom Emmer, whose effort to become Speaker was torpedoed by Donald Trump, now endorsed him. What do you make of that in terms of, um, in terms of a possible future Trump candidacy and presidency? Well, you're right to highlight this. Um, I think too often, our con the way we talk about threats to democracy is as, it's as though it's just channeled through Trump and Trump alone. And if we can get past Trump, we're free and clear. Um, but Trump has captured a party. And Trump has all sorts of organized interests that are, are organizing uh, for a second term um, so that he can be much more effectual um, in his second go around than he was in his first. He has a, a base of popular support that ensures that he's the front runner through the primary season. Nobody's even close in trying to um, uh, secure the Republican nomination. And there's a, a, a deep bench of would-be imitators of Trump. The idea that threats to democracy are personal in nature, they're about the guy, the, 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 the individual that is Trump and his um, idiosyncrasies is to miss the big structural um, forces at play that are that have, again, captured a party um, and that are channeled through um, through populism, which has really taken hold of our politics. And so you've teed up the next question, which is give me a sense of some of those deeper forces that are challenging democracy that you wrote about before January 6th, before all of the things that have happened more recently. Yeah, in this book that I wrote with Terry Moe um, out at Stanford uh, called President's Populism, the Crisis of Democracy, we, we talk about how the way to understand Trump is that he is uh, channeling um, and aggravating um, and lifting up populist sentiments, which are deeply anti-institutional in orientation, which um, are an effort to roll back democratic um, commitments, sometimes in the form of law, sometimes in the form of norms. Um, and, and, and he's able to play on that because there's this basic level of gross disaffection um, and anger towards a system that significant portions of the American public feels has failed them. Um, they, they feel like the government hasn't addressed their concerns. There's, there are, are racial dimensions to this as well. There's a deep sense of anger and disaffection roiling um, uh, a, a non-trivial portion of our public that he, uh, he being Trump, has tapped into um, and, and does, has done to, to considerable effect. And it's for that reason that as an outsider in 2016 with mm -hmm. 15 other people who were mainstays of the Republican Party, he was able to win out um, get the nomination and grab hold of a party and redirect it and, in ways that are all but 
you can't, it, it looks nothing like the party of Ronald Reagan today. And so when somebody like President Biden talks about a threat to democracy, you have a group of people who are saying, yeah, but what has democracy done for me lately? And, and so what I wonder is what you make of President Biden's meeting with historians who, who apparently told him, according to reporting, this is a recent meeting, said you must talk about this threat to democracy more. What do you, what do you make of that? And, and do you think that will be effective uh, in the current political state we are in? I think it's a tough call. To my mind, the health and well-being of our democracy is decidedly on the ballot in the upcoming election. Um, and uh, there are huge stakes involved, uh, material stakes involved in, in, in the, the, the future of our democracy. Um, it isn't altogether clear, though, that the way that Biden secures re-election is by holding that up front and center. Um, first, when you think about the moderates who are going to you know, who, the, the, that sliver of, of independents who haven't made up their mind about how they're going to vote, the idea that democracy is going to matter more than standard concerns about jobs and unemployment and um, the state of the economy and their ability to pay for, um, put food on the table and the like. It's not clear at all that, 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 that that's going to be the winning ticket. It also is the case that he's going to um, depend upon large turnout from his base, primarily from African Americans in his base, and holding up democracy as the core concern um, for a group that has had a troubled relationship with democracy, that has not felt like its rights and prerogatives have always been honored in the in the course of American history. Um, it's not that that's going to be the thing that's going to boost turnout. So. It's a tough call. It decidedly, there are huge stakes involved, but whether or not holding them up, putting them front and center all the way through the campaign is the way to win, um, I think the jury's out. William Howell, professor of American politics at the University of Chicago. Thanks so much for being with us. Good to be with you.